Uh, hello, good morning everyone. Today's webinar is on the topic of guided bone regeneration. And we need to do this procedure often to augment the ridge. I hope all of you are in good health and are enthusiastic about knowing more things about GBR procedure. Let's start with the volumetric bone classification, which I learned in France, where we always discuss on the volume of bone available for implants. Because it is of basic interest for placement of an implant in an ideal location. Unless you have good amount of bone, good quantity of bone, your implant placement is not going to be in an ideal location. The entire treatment plan depends on the available bone. All of you will agree on this point that choice of surgical procedure is volume dependent. Choice of prosthetic rehabilitation also depends upon the available bone volume and limitations of grafting surgery. And soft tissue surgeries are necessary for patients having atrophied bridges or less volume of bone because the soft tissue shrinks as the bone dissolves. Let us quickly go through the classification which I follow for all of you to know what am I discussing. So in our volumetric classification, category A bone is bone which is ideal. This is the bone we all of us are dreaming to have in every patient. And this kind of bone is found generally after recent extractions because the resorption has not really advanced in category A bone. But when we say that it is found generally after recent extractions, we also need to give a thought on different clinical situations of recent extraction. When extraction socket is intact with no bony dehiscence, you either place an immediate implant or if you do not place an immediate implant and wait for the entire socket to heal, that's about four to four and a half months time, even at that point of time, the resorption will not be in an advanced state. But then we also come across uh, situations where we need consideration. It is not category A because the recent extraction which shows you one wall dehiscence. And that dehiscence in one wall of a socket is not an ideal situation. So this is one, uh, one situation where you need to really work on uh, the dehiscence of the wall. And the second situation is when we lose teeth because of the periodontal reasons. And this also cannot be category A because we are removing the tooth because the periodontal disease has caused a lot of loss of bone volume and also the soft tissue volume. So this is a picture of a buccal bone dehiscence and this is very often found and at times it is difficult to diagnose before the uh, surgery because even if you take a, three, a 3D scan or a CBCD scan, not always you can find bone which is decent because it is attached to the root. And the second situation is of a young girl who lost so many of teeth and there were recent extractions when they, she, she saw me and uh, she already is in an atrophic state of bone. So we cannot also classify this as category A bone and this obviously needs some kind of regenerative therapy. Category B shows bone which is good in height, good in mesodistal dimension that is length but bone width of the ridge is deficient and this deficiency in the bone ridge width has to be treated. Now when we talk of any category B bone, the bone volume which is shrunken in width again has two possibilities and these two possibilities are either both the cortical plates are intact with some volume of cancerous bone within. So this is a typical uh, scan image of, of, of a patient where she is in category B because the width is not 5 or 5.5 millimeters. This is not enough to place even the 3.5 millimeter implant. But as you can very well notice that both the cortical plates here are intact and you also can find some cancerous bone within. And when you have such situations, then you have possibility of some bone manipulation techniques like bone expansion or even drip splitting. But then there are also 
possible situations where it is category B because the width is gone, height is fine, length is fine, but one cortical plate is intact and normally or usually buccal cortical plate is missing because lingual and palatal missing is not a common scenario. If lingual or palatal goes, then even the buccal cortical plate goes away. That means that when you come across a patient like this where entire buccal cortical plate is missing, as you can see in the first picture, that clinically if you see the situation it's it's difficult for you to know whether it's just single plate or both the plates are intact and uh, when you're operating the patient after raising the plaque you can very well see here that the buccal plate is missing even in an image which is taken prior to surgery you can read this image very well that the whole palatal bone is intact but the buccal plate is only present in the apical region rest of the intact plate is missing and such type of patients obviously need some procedure. Category C and D we are not going to discuss in detail because these are not uh, included in today's topic. But here you find complete atrophied alveolar bone. Basal bone is intact and in category D it also starts getting atrophied. Reconstruction is required for root form implants. Look at the clinical case. Now this patient obviously is for an over danger because you, what you have here is only bone in the symphysis where you are um, going to place four implants for an over danger. And if you look at the inter space also, this patient is not for fixed processes. And a category D patient, this lady was on steroids for a very long time of her life and has really undergone huge atrophy of bone where no implant is possible because if you try to do something here you will end up fracturing the mandible so those are not uh, today's cases of discussion implantologists are challenged in those situations when bone volume is inadequate that all of us know that we need to have adequate quantity of bone quality can be managed but quantity has to be adequate so we have to look at the surgical modifications of bone volume because 80 percent times we have possibilities of needing some modification of the bone volume so gtr or gbr is the first procedure second possibility are uh, possibilities are there are bone manipulation techniques which we will follow in which there is bone expansion bone splitting distraction osteogenesis and orthognathic procedures in bone augmentation by grafting we have possibilities of autogenous onlay graft which is a laterally placed onlay graft only for width correction or you have a 3d reconstruction where width and height both need correction today's topic is gtr there is no need to read the definition all of you know that the entire procedure is attempting to use a physical barrier and preventing proliferation of epithelial cells because what is the problem periodontists gifted this procedure to us they are the ones who are all the time facing challenges around teeth and those natural teeth are periodontally affected bone is lost either it's an angular loss or mm, it is vertically lost and then in trying to regenerate the bone they are not only wishing to regenerate the bone but they are also wishing to regenerate periodontal ligament and they also want to prevent long junctional epithelial attachment and that's how GBR, a GTR procedure was introduced in periodontics where they thought that the barrier which is used or a membrane which is used as a barrier is going to prevent junctional epithelium. Now why does this junctional epithelium trouble us? Because if you look at the healing pattern, the soft tissue healing and hard tissue healing, there's a huge difference. Soft tissue heals in 7 to maximum 30 days and heart tissue that is bone takes one sigma one sigma is 22 weeks that is almost four and a half months so when you are trying to do a procedure where you have three differential tissue responses required one is that junctional epithelium stops where you want it to stop you want the bone grown close to the uh, newly formed cementum on the root and then you want pdl regeneration unfortunately the pdl is uh, generation doesn't happen because the entire space gets um, gets uh, entered by junctional epithelium of course uh, at the end of the procedure we do have good results because the mobility uh, reduces the bone uh, in the angular uh, defect grows back and mechanical stability of the tooth also increases 
but nevertheless stopping junction epithelium is a big challenge so in 1980 uh, this was uh, discussed and uh, periodontists started using gbr procedure to exclude cells that may interfere with regeneration that was of pda then in 1988 dalian et al uh, introduced guided bone regeneration actually all implantologists should thank periodontists for gifting this procedure to us because when we are talking of implant and increasing the bone volume around uh, the implant or in the rich situation where we have less volume we are using the same principles of gtr for the bone regeneration and it is now called guided bone regeneration because here we were thinking in gtr of differential tissue responses but in gbr we are talking only of bone regeneration because here we are going to stop only the fibroblast coming from the connective tissue entering the basins there are many such uh, scientific uh, scientific studies you will find about gbr the huge studies done on gbr technique and uh, let's not keep discussing them but go to the clinical cases but this was very interesting i thought that this was first the gbr this technique was first described in 1959 that's quite some time ago by hurley for experimental spinal fusion treatment and that's how probably it started creeping in everybody's mind that why don't we try it in implantology and firstly in periodontics so when we are talking of gbr um, we we must understand that why are we using membranes so when both the cortical plates are intact and then the periosteum is also intact you don't need any membrane because peri periosteum is a natural protective barrier between soft tissue and bone but unfortunately this periosteum is so specific of bone that whenever there is bone present periosteum is present and whenever there is no bone present the periosteum is absent because periosteum is anatomically and physiologically bonded to the bone if if you create a dehiscence while extracting the periosteum which originally was present in the soft tissue vanishes because it has to attach on the bony surface in the dehiscent bone situation a barrier is needed to prevent entry of fibroblast into the bone dehiscence first 6 weeks are crucial till the initial osseous tissue gets formed so when when is the uh, indication of gbr technique after extraction whenever you find buccal bone dehiscence if the extraction is traumatic that means there was no dehiscence to start with but we created trauma while extracting or the buccal bone plate which was attached to the root surface which got extracted with the root and this is commonly seen with maxillary canines it's not the trauma caused by the extraction but the the root surface and bone were so closely adherent to each other though there was pdl in between and the buccal bone was too thin and that gave way when you extracted the tooth or a periapical granuloma which is very large and it created dehiscence in the apical region so these are typical cases where we would require gbr now how do we do it now let's talk of a situation when there is a dehiscence at the time of extraction whether it was because of the trauma or because it was always present this is my preference to wait for 4 to 6 weeks till the soft tissue gets formed and matures the reason is that membrane and the graft if primarily closed in the surgery give predictable results early delayed surgical intervention is what i i generally practice if only gbr with graft and membrane is done without implant placement then you will have to wait at least for 4 months for implant placement that means you got extracted a tooth there was dehiscence so you did nothing then after 4 to 6 weeks why 4 to 6 weeks sometimes it may take even longer because it depends on how large is the socket and a larger socket takes longer in soft tissue closure obviously the socket inside is not healed and you don't want that bone uh, bony socket to heal because if you wait for very long time suppose you wait for 4 months or 5 months then you will end up having only one cortical plate and then gbr procedure becomes extremely difficult and unpredictable because there is no containment now but here uh, we have waited soft tissue has healed and then at the time of gbr procedure i personally never promise a patient that i'm going to place an implant or no at that that time because it depends on lot of things first of all when you raise the flap 
you realize that the dehiscence which you had thought of or what you had seen or felt or palpated at the time of extraction now has enlarged and that gets enlarged because the thin bone around the dehiscence which is like paper thin sometimes gets resorbed and that's why unless you take a flap you don't know how big is the dehiscence secondly you need to remember that if your socket is large and in that socket a smaller diameter implant can be stabilized and you still have the mesial and distal walls of the bone which are open only then your graft is going to get turned over into bone because if you block let's talk about maxillary lateral incisors you extracted it there was a dehiscence so after four weeks you open it again and the buccal dehiscence is now going to be taken care of with membrane and graft but socket being smaller in size and normally you don't have much bone on the palatal aspect in lateral incisors to fix an implant if you still place an implant simultaneously and if your periphery of the implant is very close to the buccal bone then the graft will not turn over and the simple reason is scientific that whatever graft is placed over the implant doesn't have any vascularity to turn it over and that is the reason I would not do it simultaneously in such cases where I find either the, the dehiscence is too large or the um, uh, it's too large or if I am not able to gain primary stability in that case I would delay the procedure of implant placement and why should you not promise before the surgery because if you promise the, before the surgery then there is always gun on your head it's better to tell them that yes I'm going to graft for sure I don't know if I find the condition is conducive in the surgery I will place the implant otherwise not now here uh, I said at least for four months because it also depends on what graft you are using if you are using autogenous graft four four and a half months is enough if you are using allogenous graft again four to four and a half months is fine but if you are going to use only synthetic graft or only xenogenous graft then it takes quite some time i mean at times it takes nine months for its only xenogenous graft to turn over and that is why it is not recommended to use only xenogenous or only synthetic you should always try and mix it with some human bone either autogenous if not then allogenous Let's look at the case and this case is of 2006. Uh, this case was referred to be my, by my student and as you can see the bridge is failing. Uh, four is showing a huge periapical infection and even uh, canine needs treatment. Uh, he being endodontist he treated canine and then we waited for the soft tissue to heal. After the soft tissue was healed the patient was um, brought to me and I was supposed to be um, doing the surgery so he uh, she required sinus surgery and uh, this was the situation this is not a CBCT because in 2006 we used to use Denta scan which was done on a CT scan machine and uh, exercise section of this Denta scan image shows you that the canine which he had retreated looks fine but there is a huge um, granuloma around it if you look at this situation also I was worried about this part because now when I open I will again have to remove the granulation tissue from inside though at the time of extraction he had done that so my worry was I'm going to do a direct sinus lift I'm also going to do a GBR technique here and if we try to save the canine which I would wish I could have then if at all there is some infection present here it could have contaminated the whole graft and not only this graft it also could have contaminated the sinus graft so we decided that at the time of surgery let's decide now look at this case uh, look at this image uh, there is a huge buccal dehiscence in the region of first premolar and this is the soft tissue which was present there uh, we separated it from all sides removed it and after removal in this picture you can see that the canine is not being extracted it's a mirror image but you can see space around the root of the canine where my instrument was going but I was not sure what am I uh, scraping out and uh, that is why we decided that okay we remove the canine though it was very well treated with endodontics so now this is the, um, the instrument which is showing that this was the area I had a concern about so we did graft we did graft of the um, premolar obviously there was no graft placed in canine but I also placed a membrane here and this is a titanium bone shear place in the normal case scenario I would not have placed it on the sinus window but because we were uh, stabilizing it we used uh, uh, two or three big membranes to close everything and we waited for four months 
primary closure also was difficult here because the canine was recently extracted. I mean, in the surgery it was extracted. You can see after four and a half months, as the patient came back, this patient comes all the way from South Africa. You can see good amount of bone made, huge bone made uh, for placing implant. And this is what is the ideal situation. So these implants were placed in surgery. You can see even in the axial section that though you can't see a, a white line of cortical bone, the amount between the palatal and the cortical peripheral bone is good enough to place a good size implant. And you can see very well that the ridge doesn't show any dehiscence now. And three side implants are placed here. They were placed by him. Uh, but he had come to Pune to do the surgery. And uh, this was the post-operative image immediately taken after the surgery. Unfortunately, I don't have any prosthetic image of this case. But uh, luckily in uh, 2020, early 2020, in January, this lady came back from South Africa. Uh, I don't have her photograph here right now. Uh, it's locked in the clinic, but I have the image where you can see all the implants are doing well. She came to see me because this crown had started slightly wobbling. And you also can see in the earlier picture, you don't see much bone loss. But here there is some more bone loss because of the micro movement. But in this situation, the entire uh, area has stayed the way it is. You also can see the tacks which are there. Now, uh, what is the future of the tack? Nothing. I mean, you don't need to remove. They were so deeply placed that in the second surgery, we did not open it so much. There was no need to open it so much. They are titanium, biocompatible, leave them inside. Now for the procedure, what we need is the membrane. This membrane is used as a barrier between the soft tissue and the bone. It should be used when periosteum is absent to stop ingrowth of soft tissue. It should also serve the function of space maintenance and it also has to be stable, biocompatible, porous and cellulosive. In case it gets exposed, then it should be removed as early as possible. We'll, look, we'll talk about complications later. When you classify membranes, we have membranes of natural origin, which are autogenous, allogenous, or xenogenous. We also have possibility of having synthetic membranes, and we also have resorbable membranes and non-resorbable membranes. We'll talk about the selection of membrane at a later time. When we talk on biomaterials, we have autogenous graft, but it should be particulate because you're placing it in the containment, in the socket. Allogenous graft, which comes either in a crystalline form or it comes in a, a softer putty form. My preference is use the crystalline form. Xenogenous graft, which is a particulate graft. Uh, synthetic graft, synthetic graft could be hydroxyapatite or beta tricasium phosphate, uh, or even there are uh, grafts like bioglass, perioglass, and then there are composite grafts, uh, which is a combination of two. And what I use is a com composite graft. I have if autogenous is available, then autogenous with some amount of xenogenous or we also have allogenous and xenogenous combination. Look at this case again. This case was uh, also done quite many years ago, I, I suppose in 2007 or 8 because uh, uh, I don't remember the date exactly, but I have a 12 year follow up uh, photograph of this lady. So the, uh, if you look at this picture, this tooth required extraction. But, I mean, how clinically at times uh, you can go wrong. We also had probed this area. And I thought, I mean, there was a resistance by the soft tissue. So I thought, yes, okay, I mean, I can sound the bone. Attached tissue also gave me some clue that there's going to be good amount of uh, buccal cortical plate present and a good quality bone present. But at the time of extraction, we realized that there's a vertical fracture. Initially, we had seen that there's a horizontal fracture of the post, but there also was a vertical fracture of the root. And remember this, that whenever you come across any case of vertical root fracture, invariably, you will find buccal bone dehiscence, invariably. And there was a huge dehiscence. As it was a huge dehiscence, I did not place implant on the same day. So we called her uh, after four to six weeks of soft tissue healing. We grafted this with only allogenous graft at that point of time. And I don't have a picture to show you, but I used a titanium bone shield as a membrane. And we waited again for four months or four and a half months to allow the graft to turn over into bone. 
and uh, that one sigma period is important. Look at this bone. Huge amount of bone is available. Unfortunately, this bone is little soft because four months it has not matured into lamellar bone. So while doing an osteotomy, uh, my osteotomy looks little buckle and it should have been little more palatal. Now what happens actually in the procedure is you are trying to enter also the palatal bone but the palatal bone is so resistant that your burr slips and then you end up having uh, osteotomy which is little buckle. Nevertheless, we placed a 3.8 millimeter diameter implant there which was little buckle but in the prosthetic phase after I think at that point of time we used to wait for um, if I am not mistaken for 6 months in maxilla. And what you can see here is little grayness. I could have obviously you know, gone ahead and placed a crown immediately because there is some amount of attached tissue. But I thought why don't we place some connective tissue graft so that I get a good profile of this area. And this was taken from the pouch of single incision. And it was placed, sub it's a sub epithelial connective tissue graft placement. Today, if I do the same procedure, I would not create a pouch and I would not take the connective tissue from inside because this connective tissue is not very stable. Today, I would uh, rather take a free gingival graft and use Zuckeli's technique where uh, you get tough tissue because this tissue has a lot of glandular structure and a lot of fat in it and it's very slippery. It is very difficult to manage and in the long run, it doesn't show uh, great stability. So this was after the surgery, after we finished her processes and then I have an 8 year follow picture of her and look at the radiograph that the bone is stable around the implant, there is no problem. This is a 12 year follow up, she had recently come to the clinic and even in this radiograph you find that the bone hasn't moved at all and I am very happy to see this result of a patient after 12 years. Now let me share a case of my student Dr. Kamal Kiswani who was pursuing his master's degree in implantology at the Goethe University that is University of Frankfurt and I was his tutor and being his tutor I had to really go through each case with him in detail of how is he going ahead with the treatment protocols. So th these were the photographs shown by him to me that this girl has lost her canine and uh, these were some earlier pictures uh, before extraction taken by him and there was a pathology here and then he couldn't save the tooth so he extracted the tooth, he did root canal of this and uh, there was a huge dehiscence at that point of time. These were the photographs taken by him before I accepted his tutorship and uh, he is showing uh, the huge buccal lesion and he's cleaned everything. You can see it looks clean and nice. So he said that is this a good patient now because four months are over and the bone must have been made already. So I said okay go ahead let's take her, her CBCT scan. So in the CBCT scan you still see the image and after the CBCT was done he called me and he said doctor we are uh, posting this patient for the surgery but uh, I don't have a 14 millimeter long implant and uh, the whole bone uh, is a pikel. Uh, where I will have to stabilize the implant so I need 14 millimeter of ankylose which I will go subcrestal at least by 2 millimeter that means the 14 millimeter implant will go 15 millimeters inside and even I didn't have that in my stock so I said why do you need such a long implant so he brought the, the whole uh, image to me and then uh, the center had done this for him that okay you need a long implant and when I saw this image, I said, Come on, the, there is no palatal bone. You can see there is no palatal bone, there is no buccal bone. I really doubt, do we have bone here? Because read this image carefully that whatever tooth uh, you've kept there, that is the lateral incisor, uh, shows <coughs> root canal filling. There is also some periapical lesion around it. But if you look at this image, because we will be interested in placing implant next to the lateral and there is a palatal, uh, palatal dehiscence, there is a buccal dehiscence and uh, I don't think that we will be able to place implant simultaneously. So let's open and do GBR. If you think that GBR is needed, then let's do GBR and not place a 14 millimeter long implant and wait. As you can see, uh, this is the, the track, fistulous track which is still entering the, the region and the soft tissue was inside. We cleaned the soft tissue around the entire region 
and this photograph was purposely taken because this instrument the Bedosla elevator is gone parallel and from the buckle window you can see the, the periosteal elevator that means that palatal uh, dehiscence which was seen also is present which needs to be taken care of because suppose I do only membrane on the buccal side and place graft the palatal tissue will uh, encroach the area and again at the end of it we will have nothing left there. So uh, this was the tissue which was removed we placed only allogenous bone graft here and this was a bone shield of titanium and it has been fixed with tacks and then we need to also have periosteal releasing incision because now your volume has gone up you can very well see the change in the volume uh, what was there initially in the surgery and what is there now and this primary closure is very important even the the incision line which always has to be away from the area of interest never give vertical incision here because that vertical incision will cause membrane exposure uh, which is not uh, you are not wanting it that will create a problem and then look look at the picture beautiful bone is made in four four and a half months to place another implant the buccal uh, fryer shield has been removed and the parallel will remove soon and then uh, the implant was placed and he could complete the case with good aesthetic result uh, of canine replacement in a young girl. Now let's take a look at case number four. Uh, let's start the video directly. I will tell you what was the case. She had uh, other implants in uh, area. I think even her tooth number four is also having uh, implant. Five had a root canal treatment and that got vertically fractured. So when she came with a vertical fracture of second premolar, I extracted the tooth. After extraction of the tooth, there was obviously buccal dehiscence. So we just cleaned it and, and left it there. If you notice in this picture, you can also see a vertical line or vertical depression in the soft tissue. And this vertical depression also gives you an insight that yes, what I'm going to find now here is a huge defect inside. So let's look at the case. Look at the huge defect. No buccal wall present at all. Okay. So obviously you have to clean it. Placing a membrane on the buccal aspect. First, we need to stabilize it. It's your choice whether you place graft first or the membrane first. It depends on what you are doing it and on how you are doing it. careful because you are adjacent teeth and you don't want to enter uh, with the tag in the pyramidal ligament space as far as possible. Again tag is a very small pin so by mistake if you enter it really doesn't create your pyramidal uh, lesion but nevertheless I will try and avoid it. So two tags are placed and I have the membrane which is a little stretchable. Now a small piece is going parallel because there must be some parallel effect otherwise I will not place it. But I am not going to use a tag on the parallel aspect. My uh, flap is not so big to go, uh, go there and anyway placing a tag is difficult on the parallel aspect. This is a mixture of xenograft and allograft. But allograft is not in a pretty format. A mineral structure or um, collagen content has been removed. It's only the mineral structure. There is no vertical pleasing incision given, and as far as possible, I would like to avoid vertical pleasing incisions, and that's why one extra papilla has been removed. If you open it carefully and close it carefully, you will not find any decision. So the 
of suture is the suture of closing the curtain and then you can add on sutures and close it primarily so this surgery was done for taking care of the buccal dehiscence and now we have the next surgery which is going to show you how great bone was created after four or four and a half months time and removing the tags with the scalpel so they are attached to the flap and I try to raise the flap without releasing sometimes the flap can get compromised this is coming out muscly because the tissue must be very thin but look at the amount of bone here huge amount of bone available for placing an implant We have huge amount of more bone on the buccal aspect also and implant will be placed right in the center. Okay, I am placing an implant of 4.5 mm diameter and despite of a huge implant I still have good amount of bone on the buccal aspect. Oh, sorry, it's a 3.5 mm diameter. The implant was so stable and the quality of bone was so good that we decided to load this implant immediately. The placement top was good. This is a 3M shell which we have chosen. So first I will place an abutment, top tightening, and this is top tightening at 25 mm. orthodontic separator which we use in the neck of the abutment before making the crown so that no raising enters this. This has been sandcasted from inside because it's too smooth and I'm filling it with shape it, polish it and once that is done you will have to remove the separator don't forget to remove the separator and now this will be cemented remove the excess cement Thank you.
so eccentric as well as explosive positions. So it is not creating any interference. So this is a case where uh, we, uh, this is a post-operative radiograph. This is a case where we placed only membrane graft and came back at a later time to place an implant. Now this is another patient uh, having a vertical tooth fracture and because of her vertical fracture, as you can very well see in this axial image, that the premolar has lost the buccal cortical plate and there is quite a big lesion around it. And this is, has caused obviously the dehiscence. And we have decided to extract the tooth. So we extracted the tooth, cleaned and did nothing. And then as the soft tissue, you can see that it's still healing. Socket is not healed completely, but soft tissue has primarily closed and it's tough enough for me to incise and close again. And only then after You have to release it and then close this primarily. The similar case of a canine 
where the canine had again vertically fractured as you can very well see in this image and she was my first patient of ankylosing implant of 2007 she's a school friend of mine and this central incisor was placed at that point of time then a premolar implant was placed and then she disappeared for quite some time she did not come back for restoration and when her canine started having some problems she came back again to the clinic so we decided to remove the tooth we removed the tooth and then after four weeks time we decided to do the gbr and if possible also place simultaneous implant you can see the, the buccal dacens the soft tissue is still closing in the socket region here i am going to go distally because anyway i have to open the implant in five and i'm sure there's going to be bone grown over it so this is the soft tissue which has entered the dacens of the cortical plate Initially, to separate the tissue, because curate not always is enough. And once it is separated, you can curate it out without applying much force, because your buccal bone plate is uh, not very strong. So you have to be careful by curating. So now I open the region of five so that I don't need any virtual incision, and this tissue allows me. Because unless you go through the apex of the dentures, you will not be able to close it properly. Now here, what I am trying is I am trying to do mesial because I was very very close to the premolar. After the video, I will go back to the first image to show you that why we decided the position of the implant should be mesial and not where the root was. Otherwise, we would have landed having problem in the root of four. The socket is entirely on the distal aspect, and I'm going completely mesial. the instrument you just calculate and just turn your instrument on that so that the tag does not get dislodged i'm just tucking it parallelly now there is no need to any further stabilization you can see how much bone is 
created over bashing plants and that's the specialty of Ankylos implant it goes suppressor and this implant on the shoulder gives us good stable predictable results so the placing of armor there because anyway we have taken an incision and opened the whole thing so remove the cover screw and place a former there and close the, the whole surgery okay. uh, and this is a post-operative image again unfortunately I don't have the prosthetic image to show you because uh, some of our images are not copied on the hard drive now this is a case which I recently had shown in a webinar on immediate implants. This lady needed uh, extraction of this tooth and immediate implant was out of question because uh, in the first place uh, your zenith is not um, equal to the contralateral tooth. In fact zenith on the central incisor is also high. Uh, she also needed one implant in the molar region. So we decided to take her in surgery room to place an implant in the molar and we started extracting. The extraction of this tooth was very very difficult. At times I felt that it's not getting luxated, it appears like an ankylose tooth and when the root came out you can see the entire root is attached with the xenograft and the xenograft had caused uh, bonding between the root and the bone and, that is, and there is no periodontal ligament in this and that means this tooth was ankylosed and maybe that was the reason for this zenith to go high up. So we removed the tooth, we removed all the soft tissue around it and at, at the time we realized oh what we have is what was seen on the buccal aspect was nothing but the graft which had not turned over and the root and there was no buccal bone whatsoever. There is a huge dehiscence on the buccal aspect. So we decided to send the lady home. She came back after uh, healing of the soft tissue and then uh, you can see this three walls of the socket which are intact and soft tissue entering from the buccal wall so we placed a membrane packed it as always grafted it and closed it but here you can see some laceration in the soft tissue in the vertical region and that's why I also have to close it now why this happens this happens because first of all when you remove this tissue, uh, the, the flap becomes too thin, one. Secondly, if you have not taken any vertical releasing incision or if you have not opened any adjacent papillae, then raising this flap again also can cause this. And the third reason could be that the soft tissue <coughs> which had healed on the socket was not tough enough to raise it. And um, if at all it happens, close it before the main closure. Then we waited for four months time after the grafting and at the time of surgery you can see the bone which is coming out of the osteotomy site is vascular, it's red, it's not white like, powder, like uh, marble powder and then we placed an implant. Here simultaneously I also used the connective tissue graft, we've taken a free gingival graft from the palate, uh, we'll de-epithelize this and after de-epithelization it will be placed on the buccal aspect and stabilized it and then closed it. And then soft tissue profile which we created with provisional processes. Obviously immediate provisional was not given. So after three months of integration a provisional was given. And now you can very well see how the buccal convexity is stable. The soft tissue has given us beautiful profile. And the shape of the crown also changes the buccal contour of the soft tissue. So if you make a very bulky crown then you are... Uh, zenith will go high up again. So the crown shape also has to be really designed well by the technician. And then there is a case where multiple implants were needed. This lady was to go to US after the surgery in 15 days time. She obviously required bilateral sinus, she required mandible implants but this tooth also had periopical infection. And if you look at this carefully you can see some bone plate present here and a big dehiscence here. It's not a very ideal situation for me to uh, also do simultaneous grafting and um, implant placement because that's not my 
choice of the treatment but she cannot come back a couple of times again i had promised her that if the crystal bone is intact only then i'm going to close the window otherwise it will be a delayed implant and you will come back to that the tooth is giving way this is so typical Now you have to curate this completely. Clean the socket. Wash it with beta insuline. I'm just checking with the burr without starting the drilling. What am I checking? That a 4.5 millimeter burr or a 3.5 millimeter burr. What am I comfortable with? Because the socket looks quite large, but the buckle plate is very thin, and I cannot come close to the buckle plate at uh, any point of time. So the implant has gone completely palatal. We had the three B three B C B C T, so we knew that palatally I have bone to create an osteotomy. It's a 4.5 millimeter implant. I still have a lot of space of the buckle aspect. So now the membrane will be placed on the buccal aspect. Back it always. I'm closing the vertical rays in incision first because anyway I will not be able to close the socket. Unless I take a soft tissue from the pallet, so here um, she was not ready for the palatal soft tissue surgery, so we just placed a collagen sponge, and we had to leave it open the way you can see it. And this is a post-operative image. You can see bilateral sinus uh, direct graft has been done. All the implants are in place, and this is the implant with two tags, one mesial and one distal. This is a very interesting case. This case. Uh, is of a young girl who has undergone endodontic treatment. Unfortunately, it is inadequate. Uh, she was to go to France the very next day uh, uh, of extraction. Because she came to me, I think, on some 13th of August, 15th of August. She was to leave for France for her studies, and 14th of August I extracted this tooth. And we were so close to the sinus wall. In fact, she also had a 3D, 3D CBCT with her, but I don't have images of that. But I told her father that maybe, you know, I may have to give her a plate. And that's why on 13th, we made a made an acrylic plate so that I said that if at all there's a communication, I don't want her to land up in a oroventral fistula after going to France. So I extracted, I cleaned everything. Uh, I don't have pictures of that. And uh, luckily there was no communication but nevertheless I told her that you wear the plate for some days that there is no chance that uh, something enters and causes problem. She came back again uh, after six months. Now after six months this is the OPG. Now uh, how sometimes OPG image can be misleading because you can see some bone here but you don't know what. You, you can see some grayness, you can see the white line till here very well then you can see the sinus line Maybe, you know, we may think that, oh, I don't need to do a direct sinus lift. So, oh, please send patients for CBCT, especially when you are in doubt. And see that she doesn't even have 2.25 millimeter bone in vertical height. And everywhere, uh, the center has shown me an arrow. Now, this, this arrow is showing nothing but a mucus retention cyst, which is a reaction. And this reaction is because of the tooth, which had infection. Uh, are you interested in this? Yes, you are interested in this, but I am interested in something more and what is that? This, uh, first of all, retention cyst is not big for deflating or removing. It can get raised, it's not very heavy. What I am interested is in this image. This image shows that, okay, the buccal cortical plate is intact. Uh, there is a big artery in the buccal artery cortical plate which may bleed in the direct sinus lift. Obviously, she requires direct lift. But palatally, there is something which has not healed. Unfortunately, because of the arrow, you can't see this, but there is an entire palatal socket which is unhealed and there is a dehiscence on the uh, palatal wall. And because of this dehiscence, I need to take care of this, not only by direct sinus lift, but also by GBI.
you need a vertical resin incision for a direct sinus lip surgery. The window is going to be limited uh, in the area between the two roots, between the root of the molar and molar. Even the buccal cortical plate here has some uh, decent or uh, less quantity of bone. And why seeing that image before the surgery is critical here because while raising the sinus lip, the palatal soft tissue, if it is connected to the sinus lining, then that will create a, a, a tear in my sinus elevation. So I really have to be careful and I know that her palatal socket is um, apically intact. So I will really have to be careful while ascending upwards. You can, you can see that socket from here. And now I have raised the sinus lining which is intact. This is the soft tissue in the socket. You can see the direct communication which was seen on the CBCT scan. And uh, you have to use a blunt instrument to check this. Remove the soft tissue. Look at that. Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, I wanted to show you something. Oh, look at that. There is, uh, there is a palatal, uh, yeah, this is what I wanted you to see. The whole socket is not healed and there was no palatal bone. So first we grafted the sinus. After grafting the sinus, we placed a membrane on the palatal aspect. And now you can see the socket and the parallel missing wall will be taken care of with the membrane now. Now we are grafting it because otherwise it will collapse. Palatal stabilization of the membrane is impossible so it will be stabilized only between the tissue thickness and buccally we are going to stabilize it. And you can see there is a nice pull that shows that I have tucked it in properly and I have closed this primarily. After four months, huge amount of bone is made and you can very well see that, okay, I have enough width to place a good size implant. You, you can appreciate, look at the amount of bone made. You remember how, how this was then? And we decided to use a 4.5 diameter implant. If you remember, the bone was not even two millimeters in uh, the crescent region. And this is the graft which is coming out, which is whitened. And we are going to place a 4.5 mm by 11 mm implant. Do not load it immediately. There is no need to take that risk. This is the girl is going to go back to France. She yet has to come back for the final processes. You can see, you can appreciate how much bone was there on the buccal aspect of this. And this was the final picture of her um, implant placement. Now this lady, everything is broken. Her maxillary teeth, mandibular teeth, peron plane ball, lot of bone loss. Look at that, look at that. There is nothing there. And again, all of us come across difficult patients. She would not stay without teeth. She wants teeth immediately. I have no chance of loading implants immediately. So her referring dentist had removed a couple of teeth. She had removed tooth number, uh, I suppose, uh, the first premolar. She kept only the second premolar. From the first premolar till, till this tooth, she had extracted everything. Uh, I suppose even this tooth was extracted. And then on these two teeth, she had made a bridge, a uh, temporary bridge. And uh, now she was here for the surgery and uh, hyper anxious patient. It was very difficult. She was not even getting enough sedated. Uh, we treated only for the mandible in the first go and removed her maxillary posterior teeth. And in the second second surgery, we did her maxillary sinus graft surgery. So this premolar needs to be removed, so we are going to remove the premolar. You can see that soft tissue. And then I have extracted her premolar and I need to remove all that dirty tissue. You also have to take care of the 
bag of tissue which is attached to the flap. So you have to tuck it without hampering the integrity of the soft tissue. Wash it, wash it, wash it with bitter and saline. And then we decided to place four implants in the anterior region in canine and first premolar bilaterally. We have only support of lingual plate here. And while doing this osteotomy, try and collect as much as autogenous bone as you can because you are going to need it for the grafting. to use a bone tap because lingual plate is supporting the implant so Michael's implant needs it's a pre-tapped implant it's not a self-tapping implant so whenever you feel that the stabilization can cause problem use a tap These implants also will be placed. We can slightly jump this video. All the implants are placed now, and uh, even the molar implants are placed bilaterally. And now we have to graft this whole area. So instead of cover screws, we decided to place the gingival formers because these will help me for the vertical support of the flap. And then there was some excess bone in the center which I am removing it with my method of scalpel and uh, I am going to use that original bone. I also have to take care of the sharpnesses of the lingual plate. Also need to check that do I have sufficient soft tissue for the closure or I have to release it. Okay, this is one method of using an instrument to, uh, to uh, drill. Why am I drilling? The dr uh, see, you can see through this small hole, I'm going to drill uh, uh, before placing the, uh, the tag. The reason is that why you need to drill it? The bone is too cortical. And in that cortical bone, the tag will not get uh, fixed. It will not enter. It just uh, bends or breaks. And uh, this is one beautiful instrument which I like to use. Whenever I am placing a uh, tax in the mandibular buccal cortex, especially in the apical region, where it's impossible to enter with a tax without drilling. So now here on the crest also we will stabilize it. Now after the left hand side is done, uh, close that side partially and then shift it to the right side.
you know, see, you can see this instrument very well here. I'm drilling it with a straight hand piece, and the same area I place the back with the help of that instrument. So you get stability. Here you can appreciate that. Okay, there's a small hole, and now I can place the tag without removing the instrument. So that your tag goes exactly where you have grid and it's stable. Now, now you have to place the graph. You always place tags as many as you want because see the whole idea is to have a stable membrane and only then that graph will have containment. That's autogenous, allogenous and xenogenous mixture. So on the crest also we are placing additional tag and that's the final closure. This was her post-operative CBCT. You can see multiple tags here. And now we are waiting for a little longer time in her case to do her processes. You can also see that I've removed her maxillary molars which were infected. And in the second surgery we placed, uh, we did sinus graft surgery and placed anterior implants and gave her immediate loading. Now how do you give immediate loading in difficult situations? Now this man also has a lot of problems in maxillary as well as mandibular multiple teeth. Now he's a, he runs a company and he cannot not go to office and he doesn't want to wear a denture and uh, we decided to do immediate loading in the anterior region uh, knowing very well that it's a, ta it's a challenge, it's a task. So first of all you need to extract those dirty teeth then clean everything uh, carefully. Do your mechanical and chemical curettage. We placed only four implants in this surgery. Maxillary sinus grafts were not done because with this kind of infection, I would like to defer it. And that's the protocol I follow. Now you can see the socket was large. There was a large dehiscence on the buccal aspect. Firstly, there is no bone. So I'm really defying all the rules which I normally follow. But at times you know how it is in private practice, you have to also um, make the patients happy at the end of the day. Now these are the smart fix abutments uh, which can be rotated in 360 degrees to bring them in parallelism. And now we are going to work at the abutment level. So we are fixing the abutments. These fixing abutments with the smart fix are uh, multi-unit abutments. We call them balance based abutments. And now I also have to use the GBR technique because there are dehiscences, I cannot ignore them. So immediate implant, you always pack graft, but whenever there is dehiscence, you also use a GBR. And the closure will be around the abutment. And now after closing this, we are going to use the welding cylinders. This is technique of Dr. Marco Digidi from Bologna, Italy. It's a 2 millimeter thick wire, we are uh, building it in sleeves. Now giving immediate processes is possible if you have the technician with you. I have modified this uh, for my own uh, purpose and I take an open tray impression after uh, loading these implants immediately so that I can send it to the lab and after sending it to the lab, the lab will create uh, process is for me and on third day I will fix it in the mouth. These are actually open reimpression copings. I use them for taking the bite. Again this bite is a little arbitrary but you can see the ruler in my hand we had measured his uh, vertical dimension prior to surgery. These are the caps and uh, this is uh, sorry this is the um, picture of immediate temporization done. There is a welding wire inside uh, which is giving stability and sturdy, uh, it makes it sturdy because I believe that you need rigid fixation inside immediate temporization and whenever you have natural teeth in uh, opposite jaw, especially mandible has teeth, then I cannot rely only on resin uh, material. Okay, now what are the challenges in the procedure? We have one more case uh, to end the, the lecture, but before that, I would just go through the challenges of the procedure. Uh, soft tissue primary closure is a challenge because any point of time you increase the volume of the site, your soft tissue is always going to be inadequate 
and uh, that's why your incision design if needed vertical releasing incisions if needed periosteal see periosteal re uh, releasing or um, releasing the flap by periosteal uh, incisions is done last and uh, that is done only if you need it so i always like to work in the envelope flap try and avoid vertical incisions and if needed then apically you can release the periosteum membrane getting torn at the time of tack placement now this happens because um, sometimes some membranes after getting wet become very very fragile and because of the fragility of the membrane it just gives way uh, tacks not getting fixed um, because the bone is soft and the tack you think is fixed and the moment you remove the instrument the even tack comes out on the tack is loose teeth in the vicinity do not have enough bony margin for the tack placement and cortical bone not allowing tacks to enter the surface but i showed you how to overcome this now you may have a question in mind that why do you place tacks because there are people um, showing cases without having any tacks uh, in the membrane but i am a believer of uh, using stabilization and i believe in stabilization only for one reason is uh, any foreign body which goes inside your body uh, by definition is called an implant so let that be an implant let that be graft let that be a membrane anything that is foreign which is going inside the body if it is not stabilized in i feel that it doesn't work because then it has all the chances of floating wherever it wants to float and there's going to be some bleeding after the surgery there's going to be some edema there's going to be some fluid there so uh, stabilization of the membrane is needed uh, as i mean as far as i believe in that procedure and i always stack all the membranes as you had seen uh, all the cases so far early opening of sutures is one of the complication where membrane and graft gets exposed and the second possible complication is a late exposure of the membrane so the early exposure of the membrane as you can see that i have not even removed the sutures and i can see the membrane i can also see the graft please for heaven's sake don't try to close this this cannot get closed first of all the tissue is very fragile secondly this is open this is exposed so all that food juice tea coffee whatever she has had has contaminated the entire region so go ahead remove everything and close it primarily give it time let the soft tissue heal let it come back with the enough strength and do the procedure again uh, this is another case where i grafted the site uh, i had used the titanium bone sheath and we have had wonderful results with titanium bone sheath with some limitations because it's not stretchable and sometimes in the delayed uh, time zone it gets exposed now this is exposed now such times you know you can just cut it cut it off if the time is not uh, enough or uh, mature enough for you to open it but in this case we have had beautiful bone made uh, despite of the exposure now this exposure is a late exposure mind you so late exposure is that initial procedure of osteoid tissue formation and maturation has started has happened and only then your uh, membrane is exposed Uh, this is the last case i would like to finish my uh, presentation with this mm, uh, as you all can see that uh, patient has one implant in one central incisor uh, at a very young age she got this uh, implant placed and the adjacent two teeth also have paid uh, for it you can see this implant is uh, is completely um, out of the bone but um, she also has uh, had lot of um, uh, lot of uh, basis is created so this is how it was and uh, we did the first procedure of removing this bridge bilaterally the teeth are attached there is a common bridge between two teeth and one implant and you can see uh, the zenith of, of the central uh, incisor also left lateral is healthy so we are not going to touch that and the right canine is also healthy luckily so we extracted this and you can see all that Dirty thing. There is also some bio material in the area, which probably was used by the earlier dentist. I'm just cleaning this to <laughs> see uh, what kind of surface this implant had, and it's a very old implant. As you can see, it's non-threaded implant. And um, she wasn't happy with the processes either, so she had come to me only to change the processes. I gave her a different plan, and now we are just going to remove all that dirty tissue around the implant and the teeth. There was no chance of saving these teeth. It's 
Kaspersky who had completely lost nasal bone by the time. Make sure that you don't leave any soft tissue residue. So the lingual flap also needs to be thin now because uh, there's a lot of granulation tissue. It's a reactionary tissue because of the failed implant and whatever bone loss and the graft which is there. Nothing. So now it's clean. Make sure that there's no tissue tag left. to come back in this area later so we just wash this you can see it's just pouring the red ink saline to make sure that it's clean wash wash washed and left it like that there's no primary closure also. So I want that soft tissue to grow there, and you can very well see that the xenogen is probably graft, uh, or maybe synthetic. I don't know what it was. Has done nothing there. It was just sitting there. Maybe it is synthetic. I don't know. What it is. So uh, she again doesn't live here. So she came back after a um, couple of months, as I had told her that you need to come back only when the tissue has enough strength, because anyway I will have to close this and. Uh, we had discussed possibilities of autogenous bone graft and also possibility of gbr whatever is best suited for her now this incision is not on the crest because here if you take a crestal incision you are really going to have difficult times in closing so this is called lip switch design of the incision it's a partial thickness incision start with and then you decide whether you want to go full thickness immediately or you want to travel for some distance full thickness and then go partial thickness now we are completely full thickness as you can see i have exposed the bone the nasals and Uh, we tried collecting some bone with the use of bone scraper but we couldn't collect much so instead of bone scraper we used another instrument which is called bone pen or the is not shown the picture is a biowide membrane which i used here i wanted it for the reasons of stretchability in the vertical area i'm going to place an osteosynthetic screw which normally we use for stabilizing autogenous graft here we are going to use it and make sure that it doesn't enter the bone completely so that this will help me in tenting a tenting screw also could have been used but i don't have tenting screw so i normally use autogenous bone grafts but here we decided to do this okay so we have given it shape to make sure that the no membrane is exposed in any area even not in the area of the teeth in vicinity and what i like about this membrane first of all it has stretchability secondly uh, even if it gets wet suppose and now i've tried it and i feel that you know i mean i need to change something and i remove it it doesn't get torn it's not fragile so you can always check before yes this is the bone pen by uh, some uh, korean company and this bone pen in the corner uh, is used to collect bone now you can see where i'm just drilling uh, in the buccal cortex and uh, all those uh, areas which are drilled i'm going to get bone which is collected inside the bone pen you can see see that there is huge amount of bone collected inside the cap of that and i like to use this bone pen 
whenever the scraping is not possible. So we collect quite some amount and look at that how much bone we have collected is all autogenous and now we have mixed xenogenous also in it and now we are going to place it in the area of our interest and I am going to use a huge amount of graph because I really want to gain height and bone gain width. Lingually it is stabilized and very stable so This bleeding is happening because we have taken a lot of autogenous graft. So don't worry for it. You can always control it. And now you just, you just see the beauty of it. And I'm pulling this, but it doesn't, it's not fragile, it doesn't give way. So I'm using the same instrument because I'm in the cortical bone. technique where a lot of graft is inside and you are stretching the membrane and making sure that the, the pull of the membrane, look at that, it's nice stuff and that also synthetic screw inside is keeping it tall. Okay, now I can't pull this because if I pull it, the whole bone which I have created will go away. So now I have to take the entire buccal tissue to um, uh, to go over there. Okay, I just wanted to go back to show you. Okay, now, now you see how, how much was the bone defect. And now you see in this that this is healing after two and a half, three weeks time um, before we remove the sutures. And then we also gave her a temporization which is bonded on the adjacent teeth. So it's a Maryland bonded bridge. And then she'll come back after a few more months to have her processes. So with this, I like to end my presentation. This is our center in Pune. All of you are welcome to visit us. This is the team. Uh, my right hand man, uh, Dr. Kozema, has been my associate for the last eight, almost 18 years. Uh, my son, who's a prosthodontist, who's joined our practice, and my daughter-in-law, who's an orthodontist. So all of us um, always will welcome you to our clinic. And thank you very much for your patience and letting me present what I wanted to present. So, uh, let me go at uh, the questions and I can take a few questions. Okay. Um, uh, there is, um, uh, the last question was by Vasanta Vijay. She asked that how do you remove tax and should you remove tax? Uh, you may not need tags if they are not in the area uh, which are coming in your way because they are titanium and if you have to remove them, it's very easy because now the bone is made, membrane is not there. So you just have to uh, slightly loosen it by using a scalpel blade between the bone and the tag and the tag gets loosened. Mm. Okay, uh, a very good question by uh, Dr. Goel. He says that kindly explain the flat design in areas where vital structures like metal foramen is present. How to perform periosteal release in this area? Uh, basically, uh, whenever you have vital structures like metal foramen uh, and you are working in the region of premodus, <coughs> first of all, uh, avoid giving vertical releasing incision in the area of metal foramen, and this is a rule of thumb for all surgeries. So you either go mesial to it or distal to it, depending on where you're operating. So if you're operating in the anterior zone, then go distal to it, knowing uh, the, that the metal foramen is between four and five or below five. Always check the, um, the actual site because at times I've seen metal foramen even distal to uh, premolar. And uh, it has to be obviously full thickness incision in that area. And then expose the structure uh, carefully with, uh, with, the, uh, with the piece of gauze which is protecting your periosteal elevator. Why expose? Because when you expose, don't pull it too much. Make your assistant aware of the structure so that with suction also this can really get hampered. So make sure that he or she does not come in that area uh, with suction during the surgery. And whenever you are releasing the periosteum in this area, never cut periosteum where your um, your nerve and blood vessel comes out. So you have to be mesial or distal to it. You may go two teeth mesial or two teeth distal to release the flap. 
and uh, all the periosteal cut in the this region has to be uh, um, in such a way that you avoid uh, avoid cutting this uh, middle foramen structure. Uh, your incision has to be on the crystal, obviously. Mm. Choice of membrane and how do you decide which one to use and where? Okay, uh, this is Dr. Deepali Bajpayee. Uh, look, my choice of membrane uh, changed with times. Initially, uh, I started my uh, implantology and GBR techniques with uh, Gotex membranes, uh, and these membranes are, are made of PTFE. And these PTFE membranes give good results, but PTFE membranes have a tendency to uh, get exposed quickly. I don't know the reason whether I was inadequate in my surgical technique or uh, especially when you know, I realized when I go across the, the ridge like from buccal to lingual or buccal to palatal then the crystal incision would always open in 10-15 days time and they get contaminated very fast and second thing why what I did not like about uh, GTR membranes was that you had to remove it uh, because it's not a biocompatible membrane it's a non resolvable membrane so after three and a half four months when you do your implant surgery again you have to expose a lot remove the tags and remove the membrane entirely at no point of time leave it inside mm -hmm. after that i started using freos um, uh, membranes titanium uh, membranes i still use them uh, i told you the limitation of uh, bone shield uh, the bone shield can be used in places where you don't even need to remove it you can leave it because it is uh, basically a uh, biocompatible material but it doesn't have a uh, possibility of stretchability so the last case what you saw I stretch the membrane quite a bit. So if your membrane doesn't allow any elasticity, then you can't use it. And secondly, that also had a chance of getting exposed through the soft tissue, especially patients having thin phenotype. Uh, but again, I showed you a case where it was exposed in the late uh, period of time and that had not hampered my bone making. Then I shifted to collagen membranes and initially I had a, uh, you know, I mean, I used collagen membranes which had longer resorption times. And those longer resorption time membranes are available, which are cross-linked membranes. But uh, I don't know the process of cross-linking makes them tough or what it is. They are not so flexible. Uh, I also use some membranes uh, which are made of polylactic and glycolic acid. I think by the name of Biomesh I used. Uh, but again, they are quite fragile. So uh, while giving, you know, placing the tax, tax sometimes, the wet membrane, it just gets torn. And any membrane which is fragile uh, is not my choice. And then I shifted to Geistic membranes, uh, BioGuide, uh, and BioGuide I use routinely. Uh, the, the issue with the BioGuide is only the cost, but otherwise it's a beautiful membrane. Uh, mind you, it is not a cross link membrane, uh, so it doesn't stay there for four months' time. But there are ample studies on uh, BioGuide where after six or eight weeks' time, even if suppose the uh, collagen membrane breaks down because of the collagen is enzyme, um, it still works and um, I use BioGuide regularly now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which allograft and which xenograft you prefer? Um, this is Dr. Priya Singh. I use, uh, <coughs> I use uh, xenograft as BioWAS and uh, or at times I use hydroxyapatite as a synthetic graft to mix because that's a non-resolvable graft. And uh, allogenous, I always use uh, bone from Rocky Mountain Tissue Bank bone. It's available in India now. And um, that is a, um, a bone which is in a mineralized form. So non-organic non content of the bone is preserved. All the collagen, all the um, uh, cells, everything is removed. So there's no chance of cross immunity. And I've been using this bone since 2001. As I joined Lille University, we started using it. Initially, it was very difficult to get it here, uh, but now it's available in India. Um, so how do you manage lack of attached genera? Uh, it's not the topic of today, so we will speak about it when I'm talking on soft tissue surgeries. No long graft to be placed before placing an implant, ideally, Dr. Haider. Uh, basically, uh, it again depends on what graph you've used. I mean, I, I told you that uh, xenograph, if used alone, uh, let's not talk of GBI, let's talk of sinus graft surgery. When you use uh, BIOS L uh, only to graft. Then, um, at least for nine months, you cannot go back because uh, it takes time. And uh, if you mix it with autogenous bone, uh, then maybe your uh, period uh, 
is less and in six months time you can go back uh, allogenous or autogenous if you use it 50 50 percent i don't use it 50 50 percent i use allogenous uh, almost 70 percent 30 percent uh, or 80 20 or 70 30 uh, xenograft and xenograft is only for stabilization of the graph for future and then i can go back in four four and a half months time Okay, similar question by Dr. Chaudhary. Dr. is asking me, without even one vertical origin incision, uh, the membrane has been adapted properly. Uh, yes, I showed you. I mean, I go distally or mesially to make sure that my envelope flap is large enough so that I can go till the apex. And if I feel that, okay, if I feel that there is some attachment is still coming inside the defect and I'm unable to see, then give vertical incision. I'm not saying don't give, but try and avoid. Uh, because vertical raising incisions are incisions against the lines of body, so they take longer enclosure. Uh, okay, uh, there are a lot of questions asked on PRF. This is my last question. PRF membrane can be used instead of collagen membrane, or in which situation can you use PRF? Uh, now I need to really apologize for uh, for this answer because uh, I really have no expertise on PRF. Uh, I don't use PRF. Um, I, I don't know, I cannot give you the reason why I don't use PRF because, uh, I mean, we have a lot of uh, cases uh, done successfully with the membranes, without membranes, with grafts, with uh, whatever techniques I've been doing for the last 30, 25 years. So, uh, PRF is one thing which always prohibited me from using it because uh, basically, I mean, I always believed in a theory of growth factors uh, which are there in the body. The growth factors are needed for the graph, growth, growth factors are needed for the, the healing. But uh, growth factors which are removed uh, from the body and uh, reused again, uh, I always had a question in uh, my mind because growth factors are nothing but labile proteins, whether they are from the bone or whether they are from uh, any tissue from blood or platelets and those growth factors being labile proteins, we are unable to stabilize them. I mean, there's a huge research going on on stabilizing the growth factors and it's, it's my dream uh, uh, that the, a day when they can find a good stabilization without hampering the growth factor and a vector which can carry it. So I really dream of the day when we can get a, a syringe full of uh, bio growth factors and you just inject and wow, you make bone. But it still hasn't uh, happened as yet. And maybe that is the reason I always thought that PRF or PRGF, whatever we are using, is nothing but a blood clot uh, without the RBCs. And uh, I really don't know whether it has you know, uh, properties of membranes. Can it be stretched? Will it really stay there? So actually, you know, all of you can teach me about PRF and PRGF and share your experiences on that. Because I'm very sorry, I have no answer to it. I have never used it. Uh, thank you very much again and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the session. Uh, I must also um, thank uh, the World uh, Dental Association for giving me this opportunity uh, and, uh, and especially Dr. Anand uh, Mota who's always been very supportive in this. So thank you Anand and thank you. This is my first time on WDA. And I hope in future uh, you invite me again. Thank you very much.